Section 4 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.C. Guan. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 4. His Wedded Wife. By Rudyard Kipling. Cry murder in the market place, and each will turn upon his neighbor anxious eyes that ask, Art thou the man? We hunted Cain some centuries ago across the world that bred the fear of our own misdeeds maintain to day. Vibart's Moralities. Shakespeare says something about worms. Or it may be giant or beetles turning if you tread on them too severely. The safest plan is never to tread on a worm, not even on the last new subaltern from home with his buttons hardly out of their tissue paper and the red of sappy English beef in his cheeks. This is the story of the worm that turned. For the sake of brevity, we will call Henry Augustus Ramsay Fairzane the Worm, although he really was an exceedingly pretty boy, without hair on his face, and with a waist like a girl's, when he came out to the second shikaris, and was made unhappy in several ways. The shikaris are a high-caste regiment, and you must be able to do things well, play a banjo, or ride more than little, or sing, or act to get on with them. The worm did nothing, except fall off his pony, and knock chips out of gateposts with his trap. Even that became monotonous after a time. He objected to whist, cut the cloth at billiards, sang out of tune, kept very much to himself, and wrote to his mamma and sisters at home. Four of these five things were vices which the sicaris objected to, and set themselves to eradicate. Everyone knows how subalterns are, by brother subalterns, softened and not permitted to be ferocious. It is good and wholesome, and does no one any harm, unless tempers are lost, and then there is trouble. There was a man once, but that is another story. The sicaries sickered the worm very much and he bore everything without winking. He was so good and so anxious to learn, and flushed so pink, that his education was cut short, and he was left to his own devices by every one, except the senior subaltern, who continued to make life a burden to the worm. The senior subaltern meant no harm, but his chaff was coarse, and he didn't quite understand where to stop. He had been waiting too long for his company, and that always sours a man. Also, he was in love, which made him worse. One day, after he had borrowed the worm's trap for a lady who never existed, had used it himself all the afternoon, had sent a note to the worm purporting to come from the lady, and was telling the mess all about it, the worm rose in his place and said, in his quiet ladylike boys. That was a very pretty sale, but I'll lay you a month's pay to a month's pay when you get your step that I work a sell on you that you'll remember for the rest of your days, and the regiment after you when you're dead or broke. The worm wasn't angry in the least, and the rest of the mess shouted. Then the senior subaltern looked at the worm from the boots upward and down again and said, Done, baby. The worm took the rest of the mess to witness that the bet had been taken, and retired into a book with a sweet smile. Two months passed, and the senior subaltern still educated the worm, who began to move about a little more as the hot weather came on. I have said that the senior subaltern was in love. The curious thing is that a girl was in love with the senior subaltern. Though the colonel said awful things, and the major snorted, 
and married captains looked unutterable wisdom, and the juniors scoffed. Those two were engaged. The senior subaltern was so pleased with getting his company and his acceptance at the same time that he forgot to bother the worm. The girl was a pretty girl, and had money of her own. She does not come into the story at all. One night, at the beginning of the hot weather, all the mess except the worm, who had gone to his own room to write home letters, were sitting on the platform outside the mess house. The band had finished playing, but no one wanted to go in. And the captain's wives were there also. The folly of a man in love is unlimited. The senior subaltern had been holding forth on the merits of the girl he was engaged to, and the ladies were purring approval, while the men yawned, when there was a rustle of skirts in the dark, and the tired, faint voice lifted itself. "'Where's my husband?' I do not wish in the least to reflect on the morality of the shikaris, but it is on record that four men jumped up as if they had been shot. Three of them were married men. Perhaps they were afraid that their wives had come from home unbeknownst. The fourth said that he had acted on the impulse of the moment. He explained this afterwards. Then the voice cried, Oh, Lionel! Lionel! was the senior subaltern's name. A woman came into the little circle of light by the candles on the peg tables, stretching out her hands to the dark, where the senior subaltern was, and sobbing. We rose to our feet, feeling that things were going to happen, and ready to believe the worst. In this bad, small world of ours, one knows so little of the life of the next man, which, after all, is entirely his own concern, that one is not surprised when a crash comes. Anything might turn up any time for any one. Perhaps the senior subaltern had been trapped in his youth. Men are crippled that way occasionally. We didn't know. We wanted to hear, and the captain's wives were as anxious as we. If he had been trapped, he was to be excused. For the woman from nowhere in the dusty shoes and grey travelling dress, was very lovely, with black hair and great eyes full of tears. She was tall, with a fine figure, and her voice had a running sob in it pitiful to hear. As soon as the senior subaltern stood up, she threw her arms round his neck and called him, My darling, and said she could not bear waiting alone in England, and his letters were so short and cold, and she was his to the end of the world, and would he forgive her? This did not sound quite like a lady's way of speaking. It was too demonstrative. Things seemed black indeed, and the captain's wives peered under their eyebrows at the senior subaltern, and the colonel's face set like the day of judgment framed in grey bristles, and no one spoke for a while. Next, the colonel said very shortly, Well, sir, and the woman sobbed afresh. The senior subaltern was half choked with the arms round his neck, but he gasped out, It's a d lie. I'd never had a wife in my life. Don't swear, said the colonel. Come into the mess. We must sift this clear somehow. And he sighed to himself, for he believed in his sickeries, did the colonel. We tripped into the anteroom under the full light, and there we saw how beautiful the woman was. She stood up in the middle of us all, sometimes choking with crying, then hard and proud, and then holding out her arms to the senior subaltern. It was like the fourth act of a tragedy. She told us how the senior subaltern had married her when he was home on leave eighteen months before, and she seemed to know all that we knew, and more, too, of his people and his past life. He was white and ashy grey, trying now and again to break into the torrent of her words. And we, noting how lovely she was and what a criminal he looked, esteemed him a beast of the worst kind. We felt sorry for him, though. 
I shall never forget the indictment of the senior subaltern by his wife. Nor will he. It was so sudden, rushing, out of the dark, unannounced, into our dull lives. The captain's wives stood back, but their eyes were alight, and you could see that they had already convicted and sentenced the senior subaltern. The colonel seemed five years older. One major was shading his eyes with his hand and watching the woman from underneath it. Another was chewing his moustache and smiling quietly, as if he were witnessing a play. Fall in the open space in the centre, by the whist tables, the senior subaltern's terrier was hunting for fleas. I remember all this as clearly as though a photograph were in my hand. I remember the look of horror on the senior subaltern's face. It was rather like seeing a man hanged, but much more interesting. Finally the woman wound up by saying that the senior subaltern carried the double F M in a tattoo on his left shoulder. We all knew that, and, to our innocent minds, it seemed to clinch the matter. But one of the bachelor majors said very politely, "'I presume that your marriage certificate would be more to the purpose?' That roused the woman. She stood up and sneered at the senior subaltern for a cur, and abused the major and the colonel and all the rest. Then she wept, and then she pulled a paper from her breast, saying imperially, "'Take that!' and let my husband, my lawfully wedded husband, read it aloud if he dare. There was a hush, and the men looked into each other's eyes as the senior subaltern came forward in a dazed and dizzy way, and took the paper. We were wondering, as we stared, whether there was anything against any one of us that might turn up later on. The senior subaltern's throat was dry. But... As he ran his eye over the paper, he broke out into a hoarse cackle of relief and said to the woman, You young black god! But the woman had fled through a door, and on the paper was written, This is to certify that I, the worm, have paid in full my debt to the senior subaltern, and further, that the senior subaltern is my debtor, by agreement on the 23rd of February, as by the messes tested, to the extent of one month's captain's pay, in the lawful currency of the India Empire. Then a deputation set off for the worm's quarters, and found him, betwixt and between, unlacing his stays, with the hat, wit, serge dress, etc., on the bed. He came over as he was, and the sicaries shouted till the gunner's mess sent over to know if they might have a share of the fun. I think we were all, except the colonel and the senior subaltern, a little disappointed that the scandal had come to nothing. But that is human nature. There could be no two words about the worm's acting. It leaned as near to a nasty tragedy as anything this side of a joke can, when most of the subaltern's sat upon him with sofa cushions to find out why he had not said that acting was his strong point. He answered very quietly, I don't think you ever asked me. I used to act at home with my sisters. But no acting with girls could account for the worm's display that night. Personally, I think it was in bad taste, besides being dangerous. There is no sort of use in playing with fire, even for fun. The sicaries made him president of the regimental dramatic club, and when the senior subaltern paid up his debt, which he did at once, the worm sank the money in scenery and dresses. He was a good worm, and the sicaries are proud of him. The only drawback is that he has been christened Mrs. Senior Subaltern, and, as there are now two Mr. Senior Subalterns in the station, this is sometimes confusing to strangers. Later on, I will tell you of a case something like this, but with all the chest left out, and nothing in it but real trouble. End of section 4 Recording by J.C. Guan, Montreal, February 2010